what have we said about the wedge setting in the matching model? So first of all, uh, thing that we've said is that the properties of the wedge W are key to determine uh, the business cycle fluctuations in uh, unemployment and on vacancies. That's the first, first point, it's quite important. Second point is that uh, the wage W, uh, so here we're really not in a competitive market where there's a market wage and everybody is paid the same. Uh, so, or you're not, you know, in say like a, a monopoly world where um, and there is one way that's set by uh, say a big union or something like that, or a monopsony world with a one way set by a big firm for everybody. So here, the wage W is specific to each worker firm pair. And you know, it's not impossible that firms decide to pay all their workers the same or that workers ask all for the same wage. But there's no presumption that that's going to be the case here. So the default is that the wage is really specific to which worker firm pay. Okay? Um, so that's going to be a quite interesting. So it, and, and worker and firms, I know that what's going to determine the wage is just what happens you know, once the worker and the firm meet, once they've agreed to work together. Okay? Uh, and so, in fact, because now the wage, uh, so here, because we don't have uh, a market wage, because the wage is not some kind of market variable or aggregate variable, but in, instead is just specific to each worker firm pair, a very simple way to model our wage is going to be to introduce um, a pricing function that just tells us what is the wage that comes out of um, any worker firm match. And of course, workers will know that pricing function. Um, firms will know that pricing function and people will take that into account when they make that decision about participating in the labor market, about hiring workers. It's a little bit like we have the production function that everybody knows that tells us um, how firms are able to use labor to produce goods and services. We have the matching function that tells us how vacant jobs and unemployed workers get together and how many of them uh, are able to meet each other at any point in time. Then we have a pricing function that describes a pricing function that describes the wage um, W paid by firms to work in. And of course, um, different pricing functions, because the wage is just, you know, it's just one price, it's the price of labor. So different pricing functions will have a very different implication for what's going to happen in the model. Um, and so, we can we cover the most typical pricing functions that are studied in the literature. Um, we'll cover the pr pricing functions that are the most realistic based on what we see happen on the labor market. And for each different pricing function that gives a different wage, we're going to say and uh, we're going to see uh, you know what what the properties of the model are. Okay? And so some things that's important. So not only the properties of the wage are key. The wage is going to be given by a pricing function. The third thing that's very important to realize is that there are many possible 
pricing functions. So in the same way that there are many possible production functions, there are many possible matching functions, uh, there, there are many possible um, pricing functions. So there are many functions that can give the wage uh, between workers and firms. And why is that? We've said that the economic argument is that um, workers and firms meet in a situation of, um, so the technical term is bilateral monopoly. So the concept of bilateral monopoly has been around for a very long time, since the 19th century. Um, and people have realized that once you have, so you know, when you have only a one-sided monopoly, so say a firm is a, is a monopoly, the firm can set a price, you know, and decides, uh, and in fact they'll set a price to uh, maximize um, their profits. Um, so that's one-sided monopoly. But in a bilateral monopoly situation where both sides those worker and firm have some monopoly power. There is no unique theory for what the, the way that would come out of that, what the price that would come out of this negotiation um, would be. So it's uh, because you're in a situation of bilateral monopoly. In fact, uh, there are many. The key result is that there are many um, possible prices you know, that could arise. Um, in this situation. In fact, there is a complete range. Uh, in fact, there are infinitely many prices that could uh, uh, arise. Within a range. Okay. Um, so it means that we we'll have actually a lot of leeway in specifying our, our pricing functions. Um, there are many things that can happen, and so what we'll do in, in practice is that we are going to look at the real world, try to see a little bit what are the determinants of wages in the real world, and we we'll use that to inform uh, the pricing functions that, that we assume on the labor market. Um, because in theory, many, many things could happen. So we we'll use uh, evidence from real labor markets to specify our pricing function, a function that gives a wage between firms and uh, between firms and workers. So that's very much the same approach as what we did with the matching function. We said, okay, there's a matching function that says um, how workers and firms uh, get together. But then we looked, you know, at the empirical evidence, and the empirical evidence suggests that you know, matching functions are constant returns to scale, and so on and so forth. And so we use that uh, when we made assumption about the matching function. So here we do exactly the same. We're going to look at the evidence to try to um, specify our pricing function. Um, Last thing I wanted to say, so bilateral monopoly. Uh, so what does that mean? Just uh, as I said earlier, so it means that each, both workers and, and firms have some bargaining power. It's not only one side of the market that has bargaining power, as in a typical monopoly situation. And the reason why, just uh, to wrap up, the reason why is that it's difficult to find a new trading partner. So it's difficult for firms to find a new worker and for workers to find a new firm. It's difficult to find a new match.